I was talking with uh, one of our representatives, one of our uh, directors internationally, and was talking about going overseas and about them doing some, uh, them going with me and some people that they know that I want to go with us on these trips as much as they can because I want to help disciple them, but also want to be around them because I enjoy being around them. And he said, uh, well, this person, they'll be going as much as they can, but it's really as much as his family situation will let him go. And they said, uh, you know, we would all be going all, all the time if, if it weren't for family. And honestly, that's, that is true for the most case. But when it comes down to it, um, and this goes right into kind of my message today, is that my family knows this is what I'm here for. You know, this, this, the, the mission that God has given me, the message that God has given me, that apostolically, this is what I have to do. This is not, I lost the right of choice whenever I made Jesus Lord. Amen. And so it's not, a, and, and a lot, because, listen, I do not hate what I do. I love what I do. You know, honestly, I love going overseas more than any other one thing and, and dealing with different cultures and different things. I love that because I love it doesn't mean it's not a job. You know what I mean? It's not that it's not work, that it's not something that you, that is, there's, there's hardship, there's hardness, there's, there's things that we are told to endure, right? And so for me, like when I go to Africa next month, it's going to be summer there uh, and it's going to be hot and they don't have air conditioning everywhere or almost anywhere. And so it gets really hot, and it can get really uncomfortable. We, when we were at the church in Johannesburg last time, we had, uh, what did they say, 12, 1,500 people? I don't, I don't remember what they said. It was about 12, 1,500 people there and in, a, in a building, a brick building, and it was hot. And so there was no air or anything like that. So, yeah, it, gets, it can get rough in places like that, but come on. You know, I'm not going to let a lack of comfort hinder the gospel. You know, it ain't going to kill me. I will survive, and, and, but that's what you have to do. You have to decide, am I going for comfort or am I going for effectiveness for the kingdom? And so you have to decide these things. Well, in that, um, that is my purpose on this earth is to be effective for the kingdom of God. And so I know I'm not always, uh, you know, maybe the first person you want to call if you want somebody to, I don't know, tell you it's going to be okay, you know, I'll tell you it's going to be okay if you do certain things, right? Otherwise, it may not be okay because <laughs> you have to obey the Bible. You have to do that. And so, uh, but if you need help, I will fight to the death for you, right? And so that's the difference. So I hope uh, you understand that. If you read some of these things, you'll get, you'll, you'll get the gist of that and understand it. So, all right, before we actually get started, I think we're going to have a video we got a video? Yes. Okay. You're going to see this video. I assume right there. That one's not even on, is it? Okay, look over here. <laughs> the white? Are the whiteboards in front of it? Yeah, I ain't moving that. Are y'all want to move that? Can y'all get it? Okay. It's not plugged in. Never mind. Don't worry about it. Okay. So watch that one. We got anybody to work the lights? Can, yes, we do. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Crank it up. <laughs> Crank it up. Okay. <laughs> Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things.
because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. All right, sir. Thank you. All right. Now, I played that for the purpose of I want you to realize that that encapsulates. Now, whether you see those people as, you know, doing good and how they change the world or not, that's really not the point at this point. Uh, the main thing is they did. You know, uh, every one of those people you can see there have literally changed the world. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because, like I said, they, they really don't have any respect for the status quo. Well, that's definitely true. Uh, as a matter of fact, the status quo is not a matter of not respecting it. It's a matter of almost hating it because the status quo is to let people die. It's to be okay with that. It's to give reasons for it. It's to let people continue to live oppressed and beat down in bondage and all that and, because that's the way things are. Well, years ago... Uh, well, let's put it this way. I've never been able to do anything halfway, right? That's just not my nature. It's either, for me, it's all or nothing. I'm either all in or I am absolutely miserable. And years ago, my sister-in-law once told somebody that I was like a boat tied to the dock with the throttle full on, you know, full open. And I was de that was definitely me then. And there is even times... Uh, since then that I have actually felt that way at times. Well, as I said, I'm either all in or not at all. And honestly, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, I've got nothing to go back to. I burn my bridges, burn my boats, whatever it is, you know, you want to call it. Uh, there's nothing I want to go back to. Uh, I want to move forward. Now, uh, from early on in my life, I knew that God had something for me. And I, I'm saying literally early on. Um, I knew that my destiny was bigger than the town I was living in and that I was called to the world. I didn't know how. Uh, whenever I proposed to my wife, uh, I actually told her at one point, actually two parts of one thing, was I, I told her that if she married me and stuck with me, that we would go around the world. And I said, I don't know what God's got for my life, but I know it involves the world and not just where we were at. And so I've had that uh, from early. We, uh, we got married when I was 18, she was 17, so, and I'd already known this for years before that. So um, the people I was around at that time, uh, they were satisfied working a job and going to church. I was not. And because of that, I'd quit jobs and just to go to a conference, just to go to this seminar or something, else, I'd quit a job because I, I wasn't, uh, everybody was trying to get me to find a career. I didn't want a career. I, I wanted God, but I wanted truth. I didn't want church. You know, I, I wasn't looking for church as usual. I wanted truth. I wanted what I saw in the Bible. And I really didn't see that in any church that I went to. I saw close to it and I'm not putting it down, right? Uh, if it wasn't for the people that, I came into contact with, I would not have grown to a place where I could receive from God what I have. So please, I'm not putting anybody down. I'm not putting the system down, per se. Um, I'm putting, what I am putting down is a lackadaisical attitude toward the Bible and toward living the Christian life. So, um, a lot of the people that I was around, though, they were satisfied with it. And they all thought there was something wrong with me. Uh, they thought I was crazy, thought I was wrong. I mean, you name it, I heard, the, I heard all of it, you know. Curry, you just, you know, uh, you, you just, you, you know, you just, you, you can't, what you're talking about, you can't do that. Why? Because nobody does that. Okay, that to me, that's not a reason, right? Well, that kind of thinking would still be, you know, uh, riding horses instead of having cars, you know. Uh, yeah, or as we said, uh, loading guns like this, you know, instead of like this, okay? So just, if you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so um, just because somebody hadn't done it doesn't mean it's not right to do it, right? And that you can't do it. So um, I knew that 
I, I, I knew, and I wrote some of these things down because I wanted to be, I wanted to hit them in particular. I knew that if God filled my life with his life, <clears throat> I knew that my life would be so much more than anything I'd ever seen up to that point. And all along the way, I always thought God had all of me. And then I'd found another place that he hadn't. And so I would let him fill that place. And, it go, and please understand, I'm not saying that my life was perfect, you know, on a perfect trajectory. It wasn't. It was, you know, like this for years. And really what made the difference was whenever I started taking responsibility for people and knowing that the next moment somebody could call and it'd be a life or death situation. That changed my life. Because at that point I realized I could no longer live for myself. I had to live. Um, yeah. I had to stay ready so that I didn't have to get ready whenever the time came. And when you live that way, you're going to live different than status quo Christianity. It's just, that's just the way it is. And I didn't want, I never wanted to be normal. There was nothing in me that wanted to be normal. I'd seen all the normal people around me, and honestly, they were boring and self-centered and just didn't accomplish anything for God, right? Now, I, you know, I could pull out a bunch of prophecies that God had spoke over us over the years, uh, even some of the very first ones, some before I was even born, uh, that said that God would take certain things out of me, but he would put certain other things in me. And one of those things that he would put in me would be an urgency, and that I would, actually one of the prophecies actually said that if it were not for God, that I would be useless because my mind, I would keep my mind on him day and night. And I will be honest, I, I even talked to my daughter this week and asked her, I said, you know, everything that I am doing, I am cutting away things, anything I don't think helps me do what God wants me to do, I'm trying to cut off. I'm trying to, I really believe in the, the biblical truth of renewing the mind. And if you're trying to do that, trying to renew the mind, then if you have people around you that are not, there's going to be friction. It's just, just the way it is. And, and it's you know not right or wrong. I'm not getting into that. I'm just saying people that are not on the same path do not understand you right? any more than you understand them. You know? I can't understand normal. I don't get it. You know? um, so in that, you know, I was at, when I was talking to my daughter about it, I said, you know, if I go the path that I really honestly believe God wants me to go, I become more and more detached from everyday life. And that I'm, I'm good with that, you know. But the question is, what I was asking, basically what we were talking about was, is that right? Because it makes me um, effective for the kingdom, but it doesn't make for easy relationships. It really doesn't. And, and honestly, I've gotten where I, I really... My, my best time is the time I spend alone with God. It is so much better than dealing with the drama that is in pretty much everybody's life. And so I just, I just, I, I you know, for some reason, and I'm not saying I'm always right, please understand that, but for some reason, it seems really easy to look at a person's life and say, you know, they have all these problems and they want to, okay, Here, here's where you can tell I'm not the, the pastor that most people want. I see people's lives, and all they want to do is cry about it, you know? And honestly, most church members have more of the feminine aspect. They don't want you to fix it. They just want you to listen to them talk about it, right? And that ain't me, right? If you tell me something, I'm going to try to fix it. It's just natural. And whenever I see a life, I can say, well, okay, look, I see what you're in. I see the pain, all that kind of stuff. And here's why, and here's how you can alleviate the pain. Stop doing this. Start doing this. Very simple. And then after about the third or fourth time, I'm kind of like, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm not going to keep sitting here telling you what to change. 
change or quit lying that you want to change. It's really that simple. Because if you want to change, you can change. If Listen, if I can change, anybody can change. Now, I'm not diminishing the work of the Holy Spirit in that. Because tell me, let me tell you, if it hadn't been for Him, I, I, I couldn't have, have changed. But once you make the decision to, and you start trying to apply the Bible, the Holy Spirit is right there to help you. So whenever all you do is sit and cry about it, what you're saying is, I want attention, but I refuse to let the Holy Spirit work in my life. Now, again, as I said, you can tell that's not the pastoral side, right? So, <clears throat> saying all that, okay? <clears throat> there have been probably a half a dozen people or so that God brought to my side uh, throughout my Christian life. And people that should be there, people that should be there, but they're not. Because they left somewhere along the way. And usually it's because, honestly, they can't handle the warfare. They can't handle the change and they can't handle the pressure that comes with constantly pushing forward. Right? I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying, for whatever reason, you know, maybe different paths. Who knows? But different callings. Put it that way. But because of that, they're not there. Had they... Had they been there, there would have been, things would have been different. So instead, we've gone through this constant process. Well, some of them didn't want the hardship. Some wanted fame or fortune, and they thought that by connecting, you know, uh, they could get that. Um, but here's the thing. If something is important to you, you make a way. If it's not, you make an excuse. That's what it comes down to. So if it is true that with Christ, through Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If it's true that with God all things are possible, then the possibility of doing things is not even in the equation. The possibility is there. Now it comes back to, notice, with God. The key is, are you doing it with God? In other words, are you connected to God to the degree that will allow him to work this out in your life? Now, I'm saying all that to get back to this. <clears throat> Some, honestly, have quit because of family. There's been people, there's been ministers that come alongside me, and because, well, spouses, put it that way. Uh, because of that, some have quit because all they wanted was the American dream. And people saw ministry as one aspect of the American dream. You know, I've had people look at me and say, man, your life is easy. Look at you, you know, because you got this and this, and you don't have to do that, and you make your own hours, and you do this. I don't make my own hours. God does. See, you think my hours are from the time I get here to when I leave. That's just a change of location, right? When I go home, my, my wife will tell you, even when I'm there, I'm not there. You know, she'll talk to me. I don't hear her. She'll say things. I don't, you know, and she'll tell me, I told you this. I'm like, sorry. Yeah. And she'll say, where, where are you? Are you in Africa? Is that where you're at? You're in Africa? You know, uh, are you in India? Where are you at right now? You know, I'm like, I'm just, you know, why? Because this is how I never wanted the American dream. Never in my life. That was not one thing in me at all. Right. Uh, I wanted what I saw in the Bible. And that was used to whenever I had a friend for like 30 years. And we would walk and talk about this stuff. And he, he was actually one of the ones that I would say, this is, you see the, kind of the stuff I read to you this morning, 9 o'clock service, of, well, uh, going from house to house, and you go into here, and you do this, and you do that. And he said, but Curry, nobody does that. He said, I said, I know, but they should be. And he said, but how, how would that work? And I'm like, uh, we'd have to trust God. You know, well, how would you make a living? We'd have to trust God. You know, I'm not saying we wouldn't be working. We'd be working. Right? But you have to trust God. And so it was, all of that was geared toward that. But I believe that what I saw in the Bible could be duplicated today. And so that's what we were pushing for. But everything in the world system and in the church world system is against that. Everything is against it. Right? And honestly, I, I don't care about being part of the church world system in that sense. You know? 
Um, I'd much rather just be effective for the kingdom of God. You know, this week, um, in, well, since Thursday, actually, I've written two manuals. I've done, written two-thirds of, one, of a book. I'm going to get the rest of it written this next week. And I've got one manual that I have the title for. And, and I know where it's going. I just haven't put it together yet and everything. But I see these as instrumental in equipping the saints. And so I'm excited about it, but that's where I live, right? I don't punch out at five and go home and just kick back and do nothing. You know, this is what I do. If I'm awake, this is where my mind is. And so because it, and the beauty of that is, or the reason for that, is that, and what sometimes people forget, if you go back and read the prophecies that, that God has spoken over us, this is, that's exactly what he said would happen whenever I started coming into a maturity in the spirit. That these things, and he would start bringing out things that he'd want, he had wanted said for years and hadn't been said yet. So that's what we're going for. Now, in this, um, yeah, in every, there are qualities that are necessary that are, if they're lacking, you're not going to accomplish God's will for your life. Now, I'm assuming that since you're here, you want to accomplish God's will for your life, right? And people say, yeah, but everybody's got a different will. No, okay, there is a basic, fundamental, foundational will of God that is right for everybody, right? Get saved, get filled with the Spirit, be healed, uh, be a disciple, disciple others, right? Uh, grow up to look like Jesus. That's God's will for every believer. Now, where you work that out uh, in your life, what, regardless of what profession or job or whatever it is that you have, that has to be the underlying thing there, no matter what. You can't say, I'm doing that, and yet, well, you know, how do you make a living? Well, you know, I sell drugs over here on the corner. <laughs> okay, there, there's a disconnect, right? And so your whole life has to be an extension of your connection with God in your spiritual life. Now, those, four of those things simply are knowledge, drive, holiness, and honor. You have to have that, right? And honor could be called integrity. It could be uh, trustworthiness, truthfulness, that kind of thing, right? Knowledge, drive, holiness, and honor. Most, honestly, are missing one or more of those qualities, so what we have to do is find what we're missing and allow God to put that in us to work it out. Amen? Because the Bible talks about vessels of honor and vessels to dishonor. So everybody's not okay. And, and I'm not, by saying that, I'm not assuming that I am, that I'm right and you're wrong. You understand that? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying we're all growing and we have to give room for people to grow. Now, but that, uh, that does not mean make excuses for a lackadaisical attitude toward growth in Christ. Okay? Last night I was praying just before I went to bed and I said there's some things because I knew there was some stuff that God wanted to get from my spirit into my head. And so I started praying about it and then I realized what it was is that because a lot of it has to do with this uh, what we've been teaching in discipleship, conversion, you know, the only real uh, convert is a disciple, that kind of thing. Well, people look at, and, and I said, God, give me an example that would best um, bring this out for people. And he said, most people think that making a decision is it, that that's, that's what you do. You make the decision, you, you say, I'm a Christian, and you're good, right? And yeah, you go to church, you learn, you hear, and, but that's all kind of, no matter what, you're okay, you're good, so you're good, right? And there's that kind of attitude. And he said, when they should be looking at it, naturally he would use a military you know, uh, analogy. He said, when they should be looking at the decision is called enlistment. It's when you raise your right hand and swear to defend the Constitution against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. It's that, you make that decision. 
right here in Dallas, whenever I joined the military, I was down at what's called the AFES building, which is right downtown. I went down, went in the front door. It was the day I was getting, uh, I'd already been on uh, kind of a deferred enlistment. Uh, and so I went down, and that was the day I was going to leave and go down to, the, to Lackland Air, Air, Air Force Base. And so I go in, wait my turn. They take us into a room. They bring us all there. And they say, when they come in, they make you stand up, raise your right hand, you say this oath. Then you turn around and you walk out the door and you go get on a bus. And used to, they would just drive you down, but now they take you out and put you on a plane and fly you down to San Antonio or wherever you're going. <clears throat> Whenever you raise your hand and you say that oath, at that point, as far as the government is concerned, you're a soldier. Right? Doesn't matter after that. I mean, you understand, you're a soldier. But now... And think about that. See, people go, see, right there, there you go. I get to make that decision. You're in. It's done. Okay. Uh, but as a soldier, as we marched out, everybody went to get on that bus. What if I had made a left turn instead of lining up to get on the bus? I had walked across the street, got in my car, and come back home. You know what? They're not going to say, well, you know, he wasn't serious. No, they're going to say, a wall. Go find him and lock him up. Why? Because I'm a soldier. Do you get that? So, the, so basically getting born again is the enlistment. Discipleship is the service. Do you get that? And whenever, once you're enlisted, now it's a matter of service. Now you start to serve, and discipleship is that service. Do you get that? And that's what Jesus was saying. Now I've got some scripture I want to give you. But we have to remember, Jesus' call primarily was follow me. And, and when he said that, the word follow me literally means be in the same path I am in. Live the same way, talk the same way, do the same things. In other words, imitate me, just as Paul said, imitate me as I follow Christ, follow me. So really it comes down to that, that just like when you join the military, when you raise your right hand, you're a soldier. But come on, you're not a soldier, Right? Legally you are, but in functioning, no. You know, whenever you raise your right hand, they don't put a gun in it and say, now go defend your country. No, they go train you. right? And they send you to get equipped and trained and ready to go. And so we have to realize that that is the discipleship process. And our life is a life of service after that. Now, when Jesus said, follow me, that is when you go down to any military and you're being trained in boot camp, then what they're doing is they're saying, here's the way we want things done and here's the way you will do them. And when you come back from boot camp, but usually before you get deployed, they send you back home, give you a little bit of break uh, for a while. When you come back home, that is whenever the people see the difference in you. Right? But what if you didn't go to boot camp? What if you just raised your hand and went back home? They're going to see a difference in you? No. Why? Because you have not entered into service. And it's the same thing with Christianity. Too many Christians have enlisted and then immediately went AWOL. Which means absent without leave. It means you, you are not there. You don't have permission to be doing what you're doing. You're supposed to be doing something else somewhere else. Now, John 20, verse 19. It says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. You hear that? As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Now, he told his disciples, you go into all the world and you teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And so, whenever that means that whatever he told them, he's telling us. And it should have come right on down now, you know, 20 centuries. And so, automatically we know this. The way Jesus was sent, we're sent. Right? And we know what he was sent to do. He was sent to seek and to save that which is lost. He was sent to destroy the works of the devil. So we know that that is our over-encompassing. But we also know that he said, here's my commandment. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. 
And if you do that, you will do to others as you have done unto you. Very simple, right? <clears throat> now, verse 22, now notice, after he said, the same way I'm sent, I'm sending you. Very next thing he does. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. In other words, to do what I, to be sent as I'm sent, you're going to need this. You're going to need the equipage. You're going to need the power that comes with the Holy Spirit. And then we know that they waited and 50 days after that, roughly. And on the day of Pentecost, they received that power and then they became bold and started doing what they're supposed to do. Right? <clears throat> Mark chapter 1, verse 38 says, <clears throat> And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. So now we know that he was sent to preach. And notice, if you go back and read this, this story, a great revival had broke out. And as soon as the revival broke out, he said, let's go. Which is exactly the opposite of what most preachers do. Most of them stay there until they milk that thing for all they can get. All right? And if it's a great revival, they want their name attached to it. So they're not content with starting the fire and letting it burn and going to other places to start fires. So... <clears throat> He says, and he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. So that's what he came to do, right? And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, kneeling down to him and saying unto him, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him and forthwith, forthwith sent him away and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Notice he didn't say, yeah, go tell everybody. We've got to get this thing out there. Give your testimony. As a matter of fact, here's a video camera. Put that on YouTube for me, will you? He didn't say that. Why? Because as a matter of fact, he said, don't tell anybody. Why? Because he wasn't trying to build fame. He knew that if he did what he was supposed to do, God would build his fame. You got that? He wasn't trying to do it. He wasn't going out doing that stuff so that he could get famous. He was doing it because it was the will of God. He said, now, uh, go with me one more place, I think. And that is 2 Timothy. 2 Tim Timothy chapter 2. You heard me quote this earlier. Paul is telling Timothy, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You hear that? Now that's a word for every Christian, every believer. Because we have to realize Jesus also spoke about this later at a different time, or had spoken about it earlier, I should say. And he says here, Paul says, And if a man also strive for masteries, Yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. In other words, if you're going to run a race, you've got to run legally. Right? <clears throat> and he said, the husbandman that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. In other words, you ought to be walking in what you're saying. <clears throat> I guess the, I'm going to read a couple more things here to you, but really the essence comes down to this. Is what you're living for worth Jesus' is dying for? Maybe you heard that before. I've heard it before. I didn't come up with it. But you have to realize, do you re the longer you're in life and in Christianity, the easier it gets to be satisfied with just status quo. Just go to church, hear a sermon, judge the sermon on whether it's good or not, based on how it makes you feel and, you know, the worship, how that does and all that kind of stuff. And we have to realize that's not why we're here. You know, this isn't, you know, as I always say, American idiot. I'm, I'm not up here performing for you, for you to sit there and later go talk about, well, you know, here's the problem. Here's what, you know, you, you didn't do this. You didn't do that. I didn't like that. It didn't make me feel good. It didn't make me laugh. Right? That's not what this is about. I'm not here to entertain. We're here to train, to equip, and honestly, to provoke you unto love and to good works. That's why I'm here. 
And so whether provoke means to encourage you and urge you on like a cheerleader or to threaten you to the point where you're more afraid of me than you are the devil. And therefore you'll go out and fight the devil rather than stay here and fight with me. Right? And if that's necessary, I'll do that too. I have no problem with that. All right? But what I want you to realize is here's, here's the real thing. As if you go to a doctor, you want a doctor that will actually look at you and say, here's the problem. You don't want one to look at you and say, ah, oh, you're okay. Don't worry. That's, you know, it's probably not terminal. You know, and, and, you know just yeah, don't worry about it. And then when you leave, uh, you know, as you're walking out the door, hear him talk to his nurse. Uh, in two weeks, we'll have a new opening for this time slot because uh, he, he ain't going to last that long. So that's not what you want. You want the doctor that will tell you the truth. One that will actually work on you to get you to doing it. If you go to a personal trainer at a gym, you don't want the one to go, "Hey, oh, you look fine to me. Yeah, no, that's good. You know, you don't want that. You want one that will push you. One that will tell you, here's what you need to work on. Here's who you're trying to look like and push you toward that. Well, we are all supposed to look like Jesus in every realm. And so we're all pushing toward that. And if you come here, what you're telling me is, Curry, I want you to push me so that I can fulfill the will of God in my life. Because I can tell you, God's will for anyone in this room is not that you spend the rest of your life sitting in these chairs and just coming to church. Right? That is not God's will. Now, well, how long you come here, that's up to you and what you do here and all that. But the real key is what you're doing out of here. You know? And to be honest with you, it, just, let, me, let me backtrack just a little bit. It is important what you do here, because I can tell you right now, we need leaders here. We need people that will step up and do things. You know what? This is what hit me recently, because I, I, we're looking at my schedule, and next month I've got to go to South Africa, and I had to stop and think, who's going to preach while I'm gone? And admitted, there were a couple of names that I was good with. But honestly, I should have had a list that I had to work through. I ought to have people knock on the door going, hey, I want to preach. When do I, you know, can you give me a chance? You know, when, when do I get a shot? You know, when are you going to let me preach? I want to preach. I should have that. Why? Because if you've been here very long, you, you've heard enough that I'm, you got to realize what you've been hearing here most of the world has never heard. You know? Because I'm not here. I'm in a great position as a, as a pastor of a church. Why? Because I don't get paid by this church. That makes me dangerous. <laughs> it does. Why? Because I can tell you the truth, and I don't care whether you tithe or give offer. I don't care. Why? Why? Because I'm still going to go on no matter what. Right? God is my source, and I'm not looking at you. If I was receiving offerings from you or you know, pay paycheck from you, then there might be that opportunity to be tempted to preach something that I think you want to hear. Instead, I get to preach because God is my source. I get to preach what he wants me to preach. Amen? Amen? So the real key is I'm here to train soldiers for Jesus Christ. I'm not here to babysit. Now, if you're a baby, we will babysit. We will grow you up. But let me tell you, you're not going to be you know, eight years old and still not potty trained, right? We would rather have mistakes and potty train you early. Right? I have grandchildren, so I can relate. <laughs> so, right? so we want you trained, and I'm willing for you to make mistakes because that's a lot of times how you learn. But the key is I'm behind you. I want you yeah, you know, I would love every one of you to come to me at, you know, after service and say, Curry, you know what? I know I'm supposed to be pastoring a church somewhere, and you know, whenever God and you, know, you think that I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. I will go do it, and I'll go pastor a church. I'll go plant churches. I'll go, to, you know, I'll go on mission trips. I plan to be a missionary. I plan to, you tell me that, man, I'm behind you 100%. I'll work with you, help you, whatever I can do. Right? Now, if you just tell me, no, Curry, I'd just like to hear you preach. You probably won't next week. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so let's hear. He says here, John 11, read these three. We're still doing really good on time, so we're good. John 11, his disciple, in verse 8, his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you, and you go there again? 
And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not, because he sees the light of, the, of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles, because there's no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I can wake him up. And you know the story. He goes and raises him from the dead. Then finally in verse 16, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. In other words, they, they were telling him, you want to go back there? Uh, the Jews tried to stone you last time you went through there. And Jesus says, hey, I got a friend there. I got to go. And so Thomas, doubting Thomas, everybody calls him. He says, well, let's all go with him. We can die with him. What? You know, he may be called doubting Thomas, but he was the first one willing to be a martyr. Right? And he encouraged everybody else. Let's go. Let's go die with him. So what does that mean? That means that he was sold out and ready to go. Think about that. They tried to stone him. You know, this wasn't some, well, they don't like me over there. They said bad things, and they went on the Internet and wrote something bad. No. These people picked up rocks and tried to kill you, right? And here Thomas says, let's go. You know, what do we got to lose except our life? And we gave that up whenever he said, follow me. Amen? So whenever we talk about real Christianity, see, a lot of people are real comfortable talking about real Bible Christianity, meaning heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, speak in tongues, signs and wonders, awesome. Hardship. Oh, wait a minute. No, wait. No, that's, wait, that's not real Christianity. Uh, you know, I want comfort. I want ease. You know? Uh, <laughs> old preacher used to say, the church is asleep. And the church is crying, don't wake me up. <laughs> but our job is to wake them up. Amen? Amen? And so everybody in here, you're all preachers. Just because you haven't preached doesn't mean you ain't a preacher. Right? You're all called to be ministers. You're all called to be disciples. Nobody in here is called to be a believer. You're all called to be disciples. Amen. Believing is what you do. Right? But you're called to be a disciple. And that means follow Jesus. One of the things that we're working for the discipleship class, I'm, I'm so excited about this plan that God gave me that I can't wait. I've been putting it together and I, it's... I just don't have enough hours in the day to get it done quick enough. But I got the first section finished uh, this weekend. And so we'll be starting that in the discipleship class next week. And I'm telling you, when we get done with this, I don't want to give you too much detail on it, but we, when we go through this process, if you are willing and obedient and put it into, into practice in your life, I'm telling you, you are going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Not a disciple of Curry Blake, a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're going to, you're going to at least, if, if you're not like him, which is our goal, you are at least going to be a disciple like the 12 were after the day of Pentecost. Amen? So, I'm telling you. And, and I had... I'd read through every discipleship book and I got all these books and here's, here's their discipleship manual and here's what you need to do. And I read it and I, when I was in Europe, in, in England, uh, not too long ago, I was with a, a man that traveled over there with me and I told him, I said, man, I've gone through all these discipleship books because I know there's something in this discipleship class that God's wanting me to do. And I said, and so I'm just kind of studying, reading up on this stuff and I'm like, I cannot find anything that has any meat to it. I said, I, I don't get it. It's all, you know, it's, it's about meeting together and, and building something in every book you read and they don't give you any real things. It's all about, here's how to have a meeting. Here's how to get people together and talk and have a discipleship class, but there was n nothing in there that would make the people look like Jesus when you got done. And so I just got fed up and I just started praying and praying and praying, God, what, what am I supposed to tell these people that's going to get into them, that's going to make them look like Jesus and turn them into Jesus? What is, what is there? And as Jesus would have it, the answer was so simple. It was staring me in the face. And then whenever I looked at that, I was amazed. And then whenever I looked at how he wanted it done, I'm like, wait a minute, this follows the mind renewal process. He goes, exactly. He said, that's how they get to look like me. Is they have to have their minds renewed to this. And so that's what I've been spending my time, is putting that together. And we're going to have it, I will tell you right now, 
well, it's going to be a process, but it's going to be a neat one, right? I'm, I'm, I'm already enjoying it. I hope everybody else does. Anyway, <clears throat> let me give you a couple more verses real quick. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Notice he didn't say, I'll make you apostles, even though they became apostles. He didn't say, Follow me, and I'll make you healers, even though they became healers. Their first job was to be fishers of men, to make disciples. First job. And in the process of doing that, they healed the sick, cast out devils, raised the dead. They, did a, they preached the gospel. They preached the gospel to multitudes on the day of Pentecost and afterwards. And they preached the gospel in houses, to families, to individuals. Recently, when I was, you know, I got a letter from Africa about when I'm coming over, and they said, would you please come to my home? And I got excited about it, and I said, I'd love to. So I got two different homes I'm definitely going to while I'm over there. And when I told them I was going to come to their home, they were so excited and I try to explain to them, but you don't understand. If anybody else finds them coming there, it may not be the close, intimate conversation you were, you were thinking about. Because the last time I did that, I was going to pray for one person, and I ended up, and there were 30, 40 people there. And so it just grew. And now it would be even more. Now it's exponentially more. So Matthew chapter 8, verse 19. A certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Now, if you remember the video at the beginning, the real essence of what I'm getting to today is this. Do you want to change the world? Amen. Because that's what that was about. People that... And it, like he said, it's the crazy people that think they can that actually do. What do you want to do? Do you want a status quo life? Wonderful. Come here, sit here, uh, you know, get, get uh, really annoyed, right? Uh, sure, you know, pay tithes, give offering, help support this, great, right? But don't think that you're doing it if you're not doing it, right? Now, I will tell you, you either have to go or you have to send somebody to go in your place. That's the way it works, right? Because everybody is called to go. Everybody is called to go to some degree. And so if you're going to change the world, if you're going to be here, then your motive, your, your mission in life has to be to change the world. Why? Because that's what you're going to hear preached here. Because the world needs changing. And it can be done. A building that would fit in this building has changed the world. It was called Azusa Street. That entire building would have fit inside this one room. Now think about that. And they literally changed the world because they gave themselves to God. And we can do the same right now. If you're a member of this church, I can tell you, and especially if you are partners or join with us and if you, uh, you know, give offerings or, or tithes here, I can tell you right now, you are already changing the world. We are reaching the world. This little body right here, is reaching the world. This ministry is reaching the world. We're changing the world. We're changing the church world, which needs a lot of change. And we're changing things. Why? Because, and it's funny, because people see us as rebellious or as rebels. We're not. You know? Unless we're, you would say we're rebelling against wrong. You know? But honestly, we're not rebelling against God. We're not rebellious. We just hate the wrong. We hate to see people hurting. We want to see the right done. We want to see people live right. We want to see people get healed. And so we're against sickness and disease and oppression and those kind of things. And, and we're against living the American life and calling it Christianity. I'm against that. Right? I'm not against you prospering. That's great. God prospers people. I'm against you being satisfied with prospering. If you're going to prosper... The Bible says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work with his hands so that he, that he has that which to give to those who have need. Yeah. If you work a job, it should be. Yes, I need that promotion. I need that raise. Why? Because there's a, a church in India that needs help. That's the way you should be thinking. Not, well, if I get that, I can get that new gadget. I can get that new thing. 
not about that. So, <clears throat> notice Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. The gospel is the most important thing. We've got to get that back on the plate. We've got to get that back in our understanding. We have to realize we are here to disciple. We're not here to just live life, walk through life, and have, listen, for most people, I hate to say it, but uh, was it Karl Marx? He was right. Religion is the opiate of the masses. It really is. That, that can't be here. That can't be us. We, we cannot just be, you know, numbed through religious talk. We've actually, we've got to become activists for the gospel and actually functioning in our life. We have to be salt and light in this world that is darkness. So, Matthew 9, 9 says, And as Jesus passed forth from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. He said, follow me. He did. He got up and he got in the path with him. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then said Jesus to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does that mean? That means that you are to have a life that you know is not going to be comfortable. There was a song out years ago by Stephen Curtis Chapman um, <clears throat> that was called For the Sake of the Call. If I'd have thought about it before, I would have had it queued up so we could play it. You'll probably hear it next week, maybe. But it said that these men gathered around and they knew that where they were going would not lead to fame and fortune, but would lead to death. And still they followed. Why? For the sake of the call. See, we've, the church has lost the idea of living for something bigger than itself. Most churches exist for the sake of keeping itself existing. We can't do that. We have to exist for the sake of the kingdom. And if this place ceases to be functioning best in that area, then it needs to be shut down. It needs to be changed. So we have to realize, what are we here for? What cause do you live for? What burns inside of you? you know, is it your next car? Is it having a place to call a home in the sense of you having property or house or, or is there something greater and further? Why are you here? Are you truly born from heaven? Are you truly here as pilgrims in this world? Or are we here to just gather as much as we can because, you know, he who dies with the most, well, they used to say when, but he still dies, right? Doesn't matter how much you got gathered up when you die. Amen? Much better be like Miles Monroe and die empty. Don't die with one book in you that should have been written, but you never did it. Die empty. Pour out. Pour out as much as you can, all the time you can, everywhere. Do all the good you can you know, with everything you have. That's how we're supposed to live. We've, we've forgotten this idea of living this life as, as, as missionaries. Listen, you may not be a missionary to Africa, or you may, maybe you are. You know, maybe I'm stirring up some stuff in you. But no matter where you live, you don't go somewhere to become a missionary. You become a missionary, and that causes you to go. So we're missionaries here. You know, the Bible term for missionary is apostolic. That's what it means. So if you're going to be around apostolic ministry, you're going to hear a whole lot of get up and go. Let's do this thing. I don't want to play church. Right? We want reality. So, Jesus said, for whosoever shall lose his life, shall, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? <clears throat> now this should have been preached to you when you got saved. If it wasn't, I'm sorry, they didn't tell you. That oftentimes recruiters aren't good at telling you some of the responsibilities. They just tell you some of the benefits. <clears throat> but in Luke 14, 26, it says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? 
lest happily after he has laid the foundations, not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, doesn't sit down first and consults whether he will be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000? He says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all he has, he cannot be my disciple. So really, again, finally, what are you living for? Just, you know, I, 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 I'm not trying to, well, I am trying to tell you what to live for, but at the same time, that's got to be you. You've got to decide. So what are you living for? What is your daily, where do you live daily in your head? Where are you going? You know, are you living to retire so then you can sit down and do nothing? Well, you know, sit down and do nothing now. You'll retire sooner. <laughs> right? Real quick. <laughs> they will retire you. <laughs> okay. But is, is what you're living, I mean, think about this. Well, and you know, I just, man, we got a plan. I'm going to get this and I'm going to get that and we're going to be there. And we, okay, is that what Jesus died for? Think about it. When you look at that plan, what is your plan for the future? Is that what Jesus died for? Is that worth his life that you could have the American dream or that you could have whatever it is? Is it worth Jesus dying for? Because in the end, only disciples are converts. And to keep his commands means consistent obedience. Why call him Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do what he said to do? It's that simple. It's not, a, it's not hard to make the decision. It's worth it. 100% worth it. So we've got to go. Okay. One other thing. Um, what, let me put it this way. I realized, you know, God brings things to your remembrance and bring things to your attention. And I remember the parable that Jesus gave about the kingdom. And he talked about this pearl of great price buried in this field. And he said, the man sold everything he had just so he could get that field, so he could get that pearl. Now think about it. Now I don't know what kind of field Jesus had that produced pearls. <laughs> okay. Last time I heard, that's not where they came from. Right? But we understand what he was trying to say. The kingdom is of great price and it's worth you selling everything you've got to get it. Here's what I'm asking you. Is the Christianity you found worth you giving up everything for? Because if it's not, you haven't found that pearl yet. But if it is, then you found that pearl. And if you found that pearl, now have you given up everything for it so that you can have it? Or are you trying to have both? Because I can tell you, I have found that pearl. It is the kingdom. And it is living in the kingdom. And having found that pearl, nothing else holds a candle to it. There's nothing else that attracts as long as you keep your eyes on the pearl. But if you don't keep your eyes on the pearl, then the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, they'll start to, d to distract you and pull you away. But in reality, we have to come back to the truth that the kingdom is worth everything. Everything. And the people say, well, I've given up this, I've given up that. You haven't died yet. Because if you did, you wouldn't even be talking about what you've given up. Because right? like Paul said, I don't think that the present sufferings are anything to be compared with what God has prepared for us. You know, the real essence of faith, people try faith. I was listening to Dr. Summerall yesterday, and he said, people come to him and say, uh, Brother Summerall, would you pray for me? Uh, because I have to go to the doctor tomorrow, and they're going to do a surgery. And Summerall told him, said, why would I pray for you? You're already going to the doctor. I should be praying for the doctor. Right? Why, why would I pray for you? You've already made up your mind. Well, you know, I want to stay in faith. Well, you're not in faith now. Why? Because you have a plan B. He said, faith doesn't have a plan B. See, the reason, here's, here's what happens. Most people say that faith stuff didn't work. And they were never in faith. Because faith means 
total, complete reliance upon Him. Until you're ready to turn loose, you can't grab a hold of God. You get that? You can't hang on to both. You cannot. That's where your struggle comes in. That's where your, all the stuff comes in that makes life so hard is when you try to hang on to God with one hand and the world with the other. Before you can grab a hold of God, you've got to let go of the world. You've got to. It's that simple. And so most people think they're in faith and yet they're still hanging on to both. And they're saying, that faith stuff, man, I'm glad I hung on to the world because that faith stuff doesn't work. Well, it would have if you'd have turned loose of the world. It would have worked because until you do that, it won't work because faith means total reliance. You got that? So, let's all stand up. Did y'all get anything out of this this morning? This is one of those I'm going to get the CD from and go back and listen to it again. Let me preach to me. Right? <laughs> There's just so much more God has for us. And, and honestly, it's time to move into it. This, this, this year, and, and because of this foundation and moving this in, the rest of our lives will be geared toward m discipleship and missions. Growing and going. That's the way it's got to be. That's, that's the Christian life. So, Father, I thank you. I trust that the words I've spoken have been words by your Spirit. And because of that, I trust that they will go forth as, as we always say, barbed arrows that will lodge in their hearts and their minds and will, will remain there until they decide to act upon them. So, Father, we thank you that by your Spirit that you are accomplishing in your people your will, your desire for their lives. And Father, I thank you that even now you're beginning to show them areas. Get rid of that. Cut that off. Why? So you can focus on this. Start getting ready to live this way. And so, Father, I thank you that your spirit is leading and guiding, teaching us, leading us into all truth. And Father, we thank you that right now we, we commit to you that we will function and fulfill your will for our life. So, Father, I bless these people. You've already blessed them, so what could I possibly add? But I say thank you, Father, for the blessings in their life, and we say let them be manifest. And, Father, I thank you <clears throat> that their minds are enlightened, that they're strengthened in their inner man mm -hmm. to walk according to your will and to fulfill your will. In Jesus' name, we thank you right now. All those that are watching by Internet or in any format, even later on, we say in Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole, be free in Jesus' name right now. And if you want to stay there right now, you can be healed, whole, all that. That's happening in your body, in your mind right now in the name of Jesus. And if you want to stay free, you want to stay healed, make Jesus your Lord. Make him your Lord in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. Amen.